Father God, we just love you. We just bless your name. We give you honor and praise and glory today. We welcome your presence as we open your word to study. Father God, we just pray that our hearts would be receptive to the lessons that you have brought forth for us. And we thank you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. We are going to be looking at one of the most difficult passages in the Bible. And it's difficult because the interpretation of it is just difficult. But the good thing is like everything else in the Word of God, no matter what the interpretation, the lesson is plain. The lesson is plain. Today we are studying, and our word today, uh, the message today is entitled, Prelude to Judgment. And it's important that we get an understanding of Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 7. Because our Lord Jesus in the sermon, in the uh, Olivet Discourse, points back to this passage as an indicator, a marker of what the world is going to be like when he comes back. The Lord Jesus says that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of man. And so we need to have an understanding of what it was like in the days of Noah, so we as believers can look up and know that our redemption is drawing near. Now again, I said that this was a very difficult passage because there are three possible interpretations for what we are going to read. And over this lesson and the next lesson, I will do my best to give you what these interpretations are. Now, I'm going to be really honest and let you know up front that ultimately your interpretation is going to be determined by really your outlook on the Word of God. Do we take the Word of God seriously? Or are we willing to butcher the Word of God in order to make ourselves more comfortable? And as I said, I'm going to give you some of the strengths, some of the weaknesses of each interpretation. But before we get to that, I want to actually read the passage. And so Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, and again, uh, I'm reading from the New King James. Now it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of man and that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit will not strive with man forever, for indeed he is flesh. Yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men of old, men of renown. And the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <clears throat> and the Lord was sorry that he made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now I'm going to break off here at verse 8. And I want to get into the interpretations and how one interprets this passage is going to be determined by how one chooses to define three terms. Who are the sons of God? 
who are the daughters of men and what in the world are these giants or in the Hebrew the Nephilim and so I'm going to give you the interpretation I'm going to give you the interpretations kind of in the order that I find least compelling to the most compelling the first interpretation is the lines of Seth and what this interpretation basically says is that Genesis chapter 6 are talking about the godly line versus the ungodly line or the lines of Seth which represent the godly people the people who believed in God and trusted in God versus the daughter of men which means the women were coming from the lines of Cain and in this interpretation the giants or the mighty men or the Nephilim are the resultant offspring from the mixing of these two lines now there are advantages to the lines of Seth interpretation the major line advantage is you don't have to deal with weirdness in the supernatural realm you don't have to deal with hybrid offspring you basically have offspring that are human at the end of the day all offspring are human the fathers are human the 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 mothers are human the offspring are human there's nothing weird going on here the disadvantage is this first off if Seth's line was so good and so godly you have to question why every person in the line of Seth except for Noah and his sons and their wives why were they all killed off in the flood if, if Seth's line is so godly only eight out of this godly line God could only find eight to say the second disadvantage I see with the lines of Seth is that the lines of Seth contradict verses 5 and 11 verse 5 reads and the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually verse 5 would kind of indicate to me that there was no one seeking God that in fact it, it was a fulfillment of what would be said later where God says no one seeks the Lord no not even one It also, if the line, if the, the Sethite line is so good, then what about verse 11 of this chapter where it says, and the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Were there only eight out of the line of Seth that weren't filled with violence? Now, I admit that when a believer and a non-believer get together, you have a monster. And you have the potential for a monster. That's why the word tells us, do not be unequally yoked. That's why the word specifically tells us that, that believers should not be yoked with unbelievers in the bonds of marriage. But the passage here is hinting at a monstrosity it says there were giants now the last time I checked when a believer and an unbeliever married got together and made an offspring they didn't necessarily produce a giant so the lines of Seth don't answer the question of giantism the next interpretation is what's called the despot interpretation and in this interpretation of Genesis 6 the sons of God represent the nobility and this idea is taken from the book of Psalm where it speaks of the rulers as God's little G 
In this view, the daughters of men are simply common women, the commoners. And the Nephilim, or the fallen ones, are the bad offspring from the mixing. The advantage, again, of the despot view is you don't have to deal with a supernatural interference in the genetic makeup of humankind. The second advantage of the despot view is that it takes into account the Eastern practice of kings and noblemen having harems. It also aligns nicely with the end of chapter 5 where you see Lamech who has taken two wives. The disadvantage Again, when you have an unequal yoking, your children might be monsters, but they aren't monstrosities. And there's no real way to make giants. Now, the despot view gets around this by commenting that, you know what? Back in the day when we had better genetics and it was closer to the goodness of the creation, it wasn't a big deal for pretty much everybody to be nine feet tall. In that case, everybody's a giant. But then that begs the question, why differentiate between one set of giants and another set of giants? If everybody's a giant, then does it matter that there are giants? Now, next week, I'm going to get to the view that I find to be more compelling, and that is the angel view. But what I want to do with the time that we have left, and today, this is actually going to be a slightly shorter lesson than usual. I want to look at the lesson that we can derive from these few verses. And the first lesson that, that we have is something that God says. In verse 3, God says, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. In other words, even though God is all loving, even though God is merciful and gracious, there's a limit to how far God will go. God is not a doddering, dot, dottering old man in heaven who's going to just let us get away with whatever we want forever. No, God has a standard. The second lesson that we find is that God understands the limitations of his created order. Verse 3 says, For he, that is man, is indeed flesh. And it's interesting because this is the first mention of flesh. Up until now, it mentions man as dust, it mentions man as spirit, it mentions that man has soul, but this is the first mention of flesh. And it's interesting that this first mention of flesh is linked to the wickedness of mankind and to this unlawful mixing somehow of what is godly and what isn't godly. And God says, he is flesh. He is this, he has become this thing that is something less than what I created him to be. The third thing that we want to notice 
is down in verse 5. God is aware of what's going on in the world. Verse 5, And then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. God saw. God is aware of our situation. God is aware of our behavior. And even more than our behavior, God is aware of our intentions. Whether they are good, whether they are ill, God is aware. He says, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil. God's aware of our thoughts. God is aware of our hearts. And then further, God is grieved. Why is God grieved? Because these thoughts, these intents, these actions separate us. From God. And rather than let us go on and on and on, God says, You know what? I'm going to cut it off. Because God, in His mercy, God, in His grace, doesn't want to see us destroyed by our wickedness. And the fourth thing that we, and the last thing that we see that, that's quite interesting, and I said that this was going to be a shorter message, is that even in the midst of, even in the midst of wickedness, one can find grace from God. Even in the middle of wickedness, one can find grace from God. And we get that from verse 8. Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Noah found grace. Notice it doesn't say Noah worked for the grace. Noah worked for God's blessing. No, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let me tell you, no matter how evil the world gets, there's grace to be found. Romans tells us that where there was sin, grace abound more. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Where sin is, grace will overflow. I have to wonder, and this is purely speculation on my part, but I really do wonder, would God have rejected a person who, during this time of his grace, before the destruction of the flood, if another family had come alongside and known and said, we believe that God is bringing judgment. And we trust in the instructions that God has given you. Would God have rejected them? And I, I, I submit to you, no. Because where sin abounds, God's grace abounds more. In other words, no matter how bad we mess up, God has grace to cover it. If we would just come to him, if we would just trust him. I guess that's the lesson for today. Are we going to trust in God in these evil times? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. What was going on? People were marrying and giving in marriage. People were doing business. Something was going on in the flesh of man. but Noah found grace. Something is going on in our world today, but 
will you find grace? Will you trust in what God has done and what God is doing in you and through you and for you? That's the question for this week. And if you are trusting in God, if you've trusted in Jesus, that he took your punishment, you have found grace. Robert has found grace. Mary has found grace. That's the question that we have. Have you found grace? And if you haven't found that grace, that grace is available to you. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you trust in your heart that God rose, raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Are you willing to find grace today? That's the question. Father God, we thank you for this short, short time in your word. We just ask in the name of your son, Jesus. As it goes out, people will find grace. That they will confess with their mouth. That they will pray that, yes, Jesus is Lord. And that they will believe in their heart that you raised him from the dead. And Father God, we know that you will save them. We thank you, Father God, for this time in your word. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. And now may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. And may his presence ever be with you through the presence of his Holy Spirit. In the name of his son, Jesus. Amen and amen.